think we'll go ahead and get started. Is this volume good? Is that okay back there? Okay. Uh, my name is Laura DeCook. I'm the naturalist for the Manhattan County Conservation Board. And uh, I see some new faces to our OWLS program, and welcome. I'm glad to have you here. We try to have this program monthly. Uh, it is what the plan is, and it's a lunch and learn. So um, if you're new to this, we just take some time to visit and have a lunch if you bring one, and then we have a program afterward. Sometimes it's myself that is, is talking, and we also have some guest speakers. Uh, while I'm thinking of it, next month, in September 25th, our topic is with Linda Fox. She's going to be talking about Bell Fountain, and so it's another history of the area type topic. And I found it's been quite popular whenever we do programs like this, as you see today. So thank you for all for coming. Um, if you would like to know more about upcoming events and you would like a hard copy of our newsletter, I have some over on the table. And I have also some things to touch and look at on the table, too, that relates to our topic today which is about the Iowa Indians and Chief Mahaska. Well, I've always been interested in local history. And when I moved to Mahaska County, gosh, nine, ten years ago, I thought, let's look into how Mahaska County is named, especially since I work for the county. And what was the history of the local area like long ago? Because I'm real interested in the pioneer period and, and earlier. And so I did some research, and what I'm going to share with you today are some stories that I've learned, information that I've gathered either online, the library's been a great resource, um, and I'll do the best I can to give accurate dates and people, but. Through the research, I found that it varies depending on your source. So um, I'll just kind of share the information that I found. And I have some photographs, or not really photographs, but slides and pictures to show you, some um, artwork that's been done in the past to give us a little glimpse as to who these interesting people were and what their lives were like. I'm going to start off. We have a picture that we see every day if we go around the square in Oskaloosa. What's really neat uh, is if you Google Chief Mahaska pictures, photographs of our statue pops up. So that's something worldwide people would see. Uh, it's, it's one of the honors from our namesake that we have. There's uh, the Iowa Indians. I don't know if you're aware of this. But they did not originate from right here in Iowa. At one time, they were further north, up in the Great Lakes by Michigan area. And there was uh, a chief who we call in our language Wounding Arrow. And uh, his actual name was Chief Mahauga. And he was an Iowa chief who was actually the Chief Mahaska's father, the Chief Mahaska that we know of, for our namesake. And their people decided to split apart, and he led people down into our Iowa region. So they moved uh, families, created their own clans, uh, and came down to this area, and it wasn't always easy because they had to travel through enemy territory, which happened to be the Dakota Sioux. Well, once they stopped in Iowa, it's northern Iowa, I'm not sure it's the, the exact location, but they set up a small village, uh, Chief Mahauga's uh, people did, and they came across some Dakota Sioux that came to see who was moving in the area. And they had kind of a, a get-together, uh, meaning to be peaceful, they had a peace pipe and everything, and what happened was uh, the Sioux were not really, their intentions were not true. They ended out coming in and killing Chief Mahauga um, unexpectedly. And so that left them without a chief. 
Now, Chief uh, Mahaska that we know of from our county, he was the son of Chief Mahalka, and he was a young boy. I'm gonna guess um, maybe just a early teenager, maybe a little before that, uh, and he became the chief of the Iowa. Well, this young fella, he, there, there was quite a, quite a bit of dissension among the Iowa's at that time because of the death of Chief Mahauga. And so the, the people wanted to get back at the Sioux for killing their chief, which is very common practice, um, kind of an eye for an eye type of thing. So they planned an attack, and since Mahaska was his eldest son at the time, he was told he was going to be chief. But he let other more experienced warriors lead the battle against the Sioux to get revenge because he didn't feel like he was had the ability to lead quite yet because of his young age. He could fight. In fact, he did fight, and in the battle, he did get the scalp of the chief that had killed his father. Okay? So he they won that battle, and then after that, it was he was shown such bravery that he was uh, soon took over the planning of all the battles for the Iowa's, and he took total control of being chief. Uh, he won many battles. And the Iowa spread out through the big central part of Iowa, as you can see in the map. Uh, and it was, uh, if you look at uh, what kind of life they had, they were not the nomadic type, like we think of Plains Indians, where they they pop up a teepee and they hunt buffalo. Now they did a more of a variety. Um, long ago, for us, um, around the 1600s, they were also hunter gatherers in the area. Um, they would use teepees if they had to travel. I think of it like a, a tent. If we're going to travel across Iowa on a bike or horseback and we carry a tent with us, pop up overnight, that's what it was like for their teepee use. Uh, but they did hunt some bison that they could find because uh, bison to the Native Americans were very spiritual for them. They provide great resources. They provided food, clothing, shelter, tools. Uh, and as you, you probably know, that the Native Americans used every part of an animal that they hunted as much as possible. Over time, they also started farming, but I'm not going to get into that yet, because that's a little further down in history. The Iowa spoke a language called the Chiware language. And you can go online and research that, and there is... Uh, a really good website that talks about the Iowa Indians and gives you visuals and videos to help you understand their language and culture. And so this is where I, I got some of the information. So if I were to come up to you in the Chiwer language and I would say, hi, how are you? As a female, I would say, aha, darika. And if you're male, you say, aho, darika. So once you turn to someone next to you and say, hi, how are you? Either aha, as a female, aha, Dorica, or aho, Dorica. Good job. Now to say, to say I am good, males say henpike, henpike. And females say henpiki, henpiki or henpike. Just a little bit different. So you can say, I'm good. <laughs> they had some other other words and I put on your table how many of you look through those I put some animals down and just a few words I'll tell you when I go to school programs and talk about the language the kids boy they memorize it real fast so if we're talking about buffalo they are called che Fox is a little bit trickier to say. Misrike. Misrike. Almost like a roll of the tongue almost. Deer is ta. That was the easy one. 
Beaver, I kind of like this one, that's why I printed it off. Tinye Bahe. Tinye Bahe. Isn't that cool? <laughs> we have a Tinye Bahe pelt on the table and a Miss Rike top, uh, belt, or pelt on the table. So if we were to say white man, it would be Ma'ank. Ma'ank. And um, let's see, an Indian man would be Wanye. Those are some of the words out of the, their language called the cheerwear, cheerwear language. Now today, if you were to find the highway people, uh, even if you go to the reservations in Oklahoma or Kansas, very few people speak that. They speak English today. It's kind of a, it's a lost language. There are a few people that do speak it, some of their elders, and those of the younger generations that want to learn it to keep it alive. Okay, so let's move on. Part of the Iowas, they had clans. And clans are, if we have the entire tribe and you divide people up with their families, each clan is responsible for some, something in the tribe. Um, there's, in the past, they know for sure that there's been a bear clan, buffalo, Thunder Eagle, Wolf, Elk, Pigeon, and Owl. Uh, Mahaska, the, uh, he belonged to the Bear Clan, which that clan is responsible for mainly being the chiefs. Okay? Uh, Thunder Eagle would be in charge of uh, a lot of um, battles, planning things like that, making sure that they're ready for that. Um, there are some of the clans that are responsible um, for planning, plant, planting the crops that needed planted and gathering. Everybody had their own particular role in a clan, and if you put everything together, they functioned in a balanced manner. So, the, again, the black bear was the white cloud family. Now, white cloud, you know where that came from? That's another name for Chief Mahaska. Okay, he had a, a couple different names, either Mahaska or White Cloud. And uh, let's see, so those are the different clans. Now, I've read that there were other ones, but where this list stopped was number seven. They said, oh yeah, there were some other clans too, but they stopped at number seven, and they made note that because number seven is spiritual for them. Okay, so that's why seven are this. The picture that you see here is of Mahaska the Younger, and that is Chief Mahaska's son, one of them. And you can see that he's dressed in kind of more of official attire for the Iowa Indians. And one of the trademarks, if you were to see a male of the Iowas is that you would see it's actually in green, looks like four lines. It's actually a handprint that's painted on, and that symbolizes the claw of a bear. So there's a purpose for that on his face, and that shows that he's a bear clan and that he is of the chief's family. Uh, this was interesting to me. When I started reading about Chief Mahaska, it says so-and-so is married to so-and-so, and this is their children, and that's their child. They became chief at this time. They became chief at that time. And I go, okay, I'm confused. So I'm a visual person, and I try to plan it out like a family tree. I could have gone much further, but I thought, let's not get overwhelmed. Let's just start small. And at the very top, I have Mahaska's father who came down from the Great Lakes region. He's the one that was killed by the Dakota Sioux Indians. He had another name, kind of an English name, called Wounding Arrow. Okay, and he was Mahaska's father. I do not know who Mahaska's mother is. I haven't seen anything regarding that. But Mahaska is in the yellow on the left. He was also called White Cloud and Hard Heart. That was kind of a nickname for him. 
And Mahaska had a brother whose nickname was No Heart or No Heart of Fear. And his Indian name was Nachaninga. And Nachaninga, from what I could tell, is younger than Mahaska. Okay? Because Mahaska became chief first. He had to have been older. So he's Mahaska's brother. He, Machininga, eventually became chief after Chief Mahaska's son was chief. Okay, so we'll walk down through that just to make it a little easier. So let's go back to Chief Mahaska. Um, the Iowa Indians, if there was a battle and a warrior died and left his wife alone without anyone to care for her, it was their custom for other warriors to take in this wife and marry them and take care of them. So that means they can have multiple wives. Mahaska was that way. One of his youngest wives, she might have been the youngest, but he was, she was absolutely his favorite. From what I've read, she was very pretty. She was very giving, kind-hearted, very devoted to him. And her name was Ranchuame. And we would also call her female, fly, female flying pigeon. Okay. Um, together, they had one son called Mahaska the Younger or Mahaska the Second. Um, he was also called Francis White Cloud is another name. So trying to figure out whose name is whose and <laughs> connect them together it takes a little study. So I, I put them up there. Um, their son, Mahaska II, we can call him, was born in 1811 and died in about 1851. Now I would say these dates are not in concrete because I've seen different things and they even say the best they can figure out is it's such and such a year. Okay? So Mahaska lived 1784 to 1834. And then his son lived 1811 to 1851. Now his son, Mahaska II, married, this was interesting, I thought, her name is Mary Many Days Rubidoux. Okay, Rubidoux is a French-Canadian name. Her father was Joseph Rubidoux IV, who founded St. Louis, Missouri. That's kind of interesting. Um, and so she married Mahaska II, and they had many sons, but two of them I put down, okay? One is James White Cloud, who lived from 1840 to 1940, and he was chief from 1865 to 1940, and Jefferson White Cloud was the other son 1846 to 1892. He was also a chief at one time, but I couldn't find those dates. Okay? And their family tree just blooms out from there. Um, it was interesting where you can go to a genealogy page for the Native Americans, especially these that I have talked to you about, and there's even a little side note encouraging people who have Iowa blood in their lines to do the um, genetic blood testing so you can find out if you are actually truly related to um, the IOAs that I mentioned because they want to keep following the family tree and it kind of disappears after time. Um, but I, I thought this was really interesting how we could actually follow the family tree and there's more and more information um, with the most recent ones of course. Uh, I'm going to talk about Chief Mahaska's brother briefly, because he played an important role in history also. So he was also called No Heart. And he was when uh, Chief Mahaska's son became chief, so Mahaska II was chief, he was an advisor to him. Um, no Heart helped him make decisions because. Um, he just felt like he needed that kind of support. So he became chief after 
Mahaska the second was I from what I can tell he was kicked out of being chief something happened and I haven't been able to find what happened so um, one thing that no heart did that was very interesting in history in 1837 he was a delegate in Congress there was an intertribal so um, the Native Americans went to Con uh, up to Washington DC and he was one of the main voices to explain to the white people in Washington DC that in Iowa these are the different tribes that live here and he actually created a map to show folks in DC where they live because they noticed that the Americans were taking more and more of their land so he really pushed in trying to say this is our area it's mapped out this is where we are okay now what's interesting is a copy of that map survived Oops. here it is and in the years 1600 to 1837 this is the illustration of where the Iowa's land is. Okay, so it's called No Heart's Map. Upstairs, here in the Environmental Learning Center, we have an area of Native American history, and there's a copy of this map, a photograph of it, that you can look at also, where we talk about Iowa history. But this is... Uh, this is quite an, an important part of history because it, they didn't have the way of mapping things out that we do today. They did it by foot, horseback. They memorized where the rivers were. Now, they couldn't be 100% exact, but how closely accurate it was has impressed people over time. So we come to Chief Mahaska. The chief of the Iowa's, quite a handsome fellow, isn't he? <laughs> and you see how he's decked out. It looks like there's bear claws around his neck, feather. Uh, the Iowa's would uh, have paint on their face, of course, piercings. They would have shorter hair in the front, but they would have um, almost like a beanie type hat that would have deer tails attached to it um, that would, and feathers as adornment for their, for their hair. So, as we mentioned, he um, took in female flying pigeon as, as his wife after her husband, who was a warrior, had died, and she became his favorite. And you can think of her today as a young outgoing female that really wanted to learn more about the world around her and she shared that enthusiasm and she um, had a part in one of Mahas Chief Mahaska's trips to Washington DC now Chief Mahaska at one time fought other tribes and with the influx of white people moving across the country and coming in contact with uh, the president and everyone who works under the president, he felt in his heart that it, the right thing to do was to not fight the white people, but to learn more about them and learn how to work with them. Because I think he probably saw that from then on, there's gonna be white people around no matter what. So learn from them what we can. He became to believe that you know, let's not fight the white people um, and he joined other chiefs uh, from some other tribes like the Oto, Missouri, Sac, Fox and they would travel to Washington DC to meet with the president and their advisors, come up with a treaty, come back and follow through with it. There were many treaties over time and the government created treaties as it was actually written out, which is interesting because the Native Americans could not read English. They didn't speak it. 
very well either. A lot of information was done by sign language. And the, at the bottom of the treaties would be the signature of the United States officials and also the signatures of Native Americans. <laughs> now this is what's interesting about their signature. It was either like a scribble, an X, a line. They just made a mark. But after that would be written in hand by an American that would say, uh, bushy eyebrows, for example, and write out what they thought sounded like that person's name. Another one would say, uh, big brown eyes. And that's how they recognized uh, the Native Americans by some special feature about them. And so that's how they connected with that signature. Um, there was a treaty of 1824 with President Monroe, and Mahaska and some of the warriors and, and other chiefs were making a trip all the way um, up to Washington, D.C. So they would travel by horseback. They would camp out at night, probably in a teepee that they put up. Uh, one night, that Chief Mahaska was at a campsite, right not long after he left home. And it was late at night, and he felt a presence behind him, and he turned around to fight the person. You know who it was? Female flying pigeon. His wife. His favorite wife. What are you doing here? You know, he was very surprised he could have killed her. So she was lucky he didn't. And she wanted to go with him to Washington, D.C. Because, of course, in her mind, she's curious about the world around her. And she wanted to see what it's like, where the white people were. So he knew that um, with history of his wives, they did not get along. They thought all the time about anything and everything. He knew if he took one wife, it would be bad news when he got home if he didn't take them all. So he put her on the back of him on his horse. They went back home while the rest of the gentlemen on the trip waited at the campsite. He brought all of his wives back with him. I don't know how many there were, but it doesn't sound good, does it? So they all went to Washington, D.C., and I'm sure they were fighting and squabbling the whole time. There's a lot of jealousy going on, I can imagine. So they get to Washington, D.C., and Mahaska meets with President Monroe. And there's little pictures I threw in. And the Treaty of 1824, and this was the United States' point of view. Okay, So it's like a sales pitch, trying to convince the Native Americans, this is a good deal for you. Okay, They wanted to establish a legal relationship with the tribe. So it was written out on paper, signed, documented, everything. They wanted to establish boundaries between the tribes so they know who was where, so they could have control. The United States wanted control. Once the tribal boundaries were made and there was peace, white squatters would begin to move in and take the best farming and hunting areas. And we know how that history goes, right? Establishing U.S. military power and deal with conflicts by removing Indians to more distant lands. That was one of their goals. And whether or not they really explain that, I don't know about that. So the military power, um, there was a General Clark. If I say that name, does that ring a bell with anybody? He had a partner that traveled on the Missouri River, Lewis and Clark. OK, so Clark, before he became the team Lewis and Clark, was a, was a general. And he was in charge of Indian relations. So any problems with the Indians would come to him, and he would send out the forces to take care of the problem. Sometimes they were um, captured and put in prison, put on trial. Okay, So they had a system planned. So every treaty was to go back to step three and repeat again and again and again, which means that this was actually just plans and how to get white settlers into the Indians' lands, okay? Eventually, over time, the treaties ended out with the Native Americans relinquishing their lands and put on reservations. Okay, now here's a fun story that I read about. 
I had to read it a couple of times. I go, this really happened? <laughs> so this isn't an actual photograph of a motel in Washington, D.C. All I know in the story is that it was a motel that had more than one story. Okay. Now imagine Chief Mahaska with all of his wives visiting, and they're constantly arguing, and they're in a room together. That sounds dangerous. Well, from what I've read, Chief Mahaska would frequent the bar that's nearby. <laughs> he would come upstairs, and one time he found them arguing. And from what I've read, the relationship between husband and wife of the Native Americans wasn't always pleasant. He'd taken a stick to his wives, even female flying pigeon, and in order to get order. So I think from what I've read and I remember is that he was trying to get order established with all of his wives. There was uh, furniture being thrown, yelling, screaming, uh, a lot of rockets. Well, once someone from the United States government was downstairs in the motel and heard the commotion and he came up and opened the door. Well, here's Chief Mahaska. He's supposed to be uh, like a, a decent fella that uh, avoids conflict, and he didn't want to lay like, claim that these were his wives making the mess and destruction. So he opened the window and jumped out. <laughs> hey, remember, I said they were on the second floor of the building. That's why I put this one up here. Well, he fell out and broke his arm. <laughs> well, if you think about it, in his typical homes, he would go outside and he'd be on ground level. They didn't have anything like a second story or a third um, where they lived at home. So he had forgotten that he was up high, fell down, broke his arm. And what I remember reading was they would have meetings and they were quite a fascination among white people. So they would get their portrait taken uh, or drawn, painted, photographs taken, and they would have to sit for a long time. They would be in meetings with the president for a long time, and they described his face. You could tell how much pain he was in, but he would not admit to the fact that he was in pain and relive the whole ordeal as to what happened. So that's what happened in Washington then. When they came back home, well, this is what the Indians brought back from Washington, D.C. Uh, they were shown, and part of the treaty was that they were given some supplies to start farming. They were given um, tools, they were given seed, they were shown how to do this. And female flying pigeon, since it was going to be the women's duty to raise the crops and plant and collect, uh, she took it upon herself, like, wow, look at all this information that I learned from the white people. It's fascinating. And she kind of pushed it on to the other women in the tribe. Uh, for the most part, they went along with it, except for some of the older women, they wanted to stay with their ways that they're comfortable with. Uh, she even wore clothes that were more like white people and, and tried to be the influence to change the attire of their people also. They were given blankets, they were given $500 a year for 10 years uh, to use, and if you think about it, they've never used currency. Anything that they needed, they would make, they would do. Each clan had their responsibility for providing. So being thrown into the world of having to use money um, it was, it was quite a change for them. And it came to be that they would have to use this money in the future to go travel to Washington, D.C. To, to visit uh, the president for more treaties. They would have to pay their own way, their, um, their time in a motel room, food and everything. They were also given some livestock to uh, start raising. Uh, let's see here. Uh, over time, in Ranchua May, she, she wasn't that old when she died. What happened was, after 
Mahaska the second was born. He was a very young boy. Um, he was out with his mom, Ranchuame, and she fell off of her, her pony, is what is described. And she must have hit her head, she died. Mahaska found her on the ground with his young son laying with his head on her stomach and said, be quiet, mommy's sleeping. So, you know, he was young enough, he didn't understand that. So he brought her back to their home, um, put her up on the, the horse with him, and had his young son, Aska the second, right behind him, holding on. And he mourned quite heavily for her over time. Uh, Chief Mahaska became a, a chief of honor uh, because of his belief of, of having peace amongst not only with white people but other tribes of people too. There's another story about Chief Mahaska where uh, it was, let me see here, the Omaha's had killed one of his braves named Crane. And his Mahaska's warriors were very upset over this and thinking, you know, there's another tribe, they killed our warrior, and we need to get back to the back at them and and send a party out there and get their scalps, hunt them down. And Mahaska says, No, you're you are forbidden to go. I do not believe that's the thing to do. We're going to contact uh, General Clark, and he will send some people here to take care of it for us. That's what they're there for. And some of his warriors snuck out. His warriors snuck out and went to the Omaha's and got revenge. They killed some. Well, Mahaska found out about this, and he turned his warriors in. He contacted uh, General Clark, and he sent some... Clark sent some... Um, People here, Mahaska was right there when his warriors were arrested. They were sent down to Levensworth, Kansas, to the prison where they were to await trial. And while Mahaska was down there, one of his warriors reached through the window with the bars on it and says, when I get out of here, I'm going to kill you. He was just frustrated and angry that Mahaska, in his mind, turned on his own people like that. Well, over time, Mahaska was back, and he was up in northwest Iowa along the Nottoway River. He's actually, Cass County is where it was. And he was at a campsite in the middle of night. There were two of those warriors that were in prison escaped, and they found him up there at this campsite. And in the middle of the night, they came in, and they killed Mahaska. Um, he was brought back to central part of Iowa, um, and it's uh, right along the Des Moines River, and it's, in, with, it's right, right in the area of the Raccoon and the Des Moines River. So right inside the Des Moines city limits is where he's buried. And if I remember correctly, I visited the Capitol once, and there is a statue of Chief Mahaska there also. Um, I tried to look for it this last spring when one of my sons went on a field trip there, but I think it was on a different side of the capital when we were on. But, uh, so he was buried, and at that time, the chief responsibilities would go to his son, Mahaska the Younger, also known as Mahaska the Second, and Francis White Cloud. Uh, some of the notable things about uh, Mahaska II was that he t went over to Europe and toured in 1844. Uh, another thing is that he attended a mission school in Highland, Kansas. And this interested me because I had family that lived in Highland, Kansas. And when I was I'd say probably early 20s, I would go down to Kansas to visit my relatives, and we would go to the reservation 
and to have dinner at the casino that's down there. And, uh, and there's also a white cloud, Kansas. So it's all referring to this family of Iowa that was actually right here. Well, that's pretty cool, and there's a connection. <laughs> Uh, Mahaska II also served as a scout for the Kansas Volunteer Cavalry in the American Civil War. Um, Mahaska II had sons. Two of them, well one of them was uh, Chief James White Cloud, who, if you remember in the family tree, married Mary Many Days Rubidoux whose father founded St. Louis, okay? And so here are some photographs that I found of them. Kind of put a face to a name. And White, Francis White Cloud uh, died in 1940. He had another son, Mahaska II did. His name was Jefferson White Cloud. He was younger than his brother. And you can tell by the picture, he must have been younger. He's not dressed in the Iowa attire. But you can kind of see some Native American resemblance in his features. Okay. Uh, that's the end of the slides that I have. But I have a story for you. One of the common things among Native Americans was to educate their children. And it would be the responsibility of the adults of the tribe to teach their children about their history, their culture, way of life. And they would also throw in some stories, um, kind of uh, stories that would explain why things are the way they are. And I thought, well, I found a neat story. And this one is a question we all probably have. Why does a turkey vulture have a bald head? Have you ever wondered that? Well, I have an explanation here. <laughs> I can find my story. There it is. Okay, this story came from a book called Myths and Legends of North American Indians, uh, written by Lewis Spence. And there is a character that's in a lot of Iowa stories called Ictinic. And Ictinek is a character that's always getting into mischief. Okay? It makes life exciting when you read it. One day, Ictinek, sore, foot sore and weary, encountered a buzzard, which he asked to oblige him by carrying him on his back part of the way. The crafty bird immediately consented, and seating Ictinek between its wings, flew off with him. They had not gone far when they passed above a hollow tree. And Ictinik began to shift uneasily in his seat when he observed the buzzard hovering over it. He requested the bird to fly onward, but for answer it cast him headlong into the tree trunk, where he found himself a prisoner. For a long time he lay there in wanton wretchedness, until at last a large hunting party struck camp at the spot. Ictinik chanced to be wearing some raccoon skin and he thrust the tails of these through the cracks in the tree. Three women who were standing near imagined that a number of raccoons had become imprisoned in the hollow trunk, and they made a large hole for it in the purpose of capturing them. Ictinik at once emerged, whereupon the raccoon skins of the birds of prey, the eagle, the brook, and the magpie came to devour him. Oops. Let me read that again. Ictinik at once emerged, whereupon the women fled. Ictinik lay on the ground, pretending to be dead, and as he was covered with the raccoon skins, the bird of, birds of prey, the eagle, the rook, the magpie, came to devour him. While they pecked at him, the buzzard made his appearance for the purpose of joining in the feast, but Ictinik, rising quickly, tore the feathers from his scalp. That's why the buzzard has no feathers on its head. Just in case you wanted to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there is a lot of information out there, and uh, if Chief Mahaska and the Iowa Indians interest you, I know that the library has a file cabinet full of really great information to read. I could sit there all day and read through it, but I just wanted to touch on some things that that I remember in, in uh, the research that I've done, and 
um, to share some kind of interesting facts with you. And um, if you'd like to, you're welcome to go upstairs and look at what we have on Native Americans right now um, and get a close-up look of No Hearts map. It's on display up there also. So unless you have questions, I appreciate you coming. Thanks, and we'll hope to see you again. Uh, she asked if Mary Many Days Rubidoux was French, and I believe her father was French Canadian, and I believe another part of her was Native American, from what I understand. So she was part. Yes, hence the, the name. <laughs> yeah. Linda, when they would go to Washington, D.C., they would stop and Interpreters, yes, very good question. Um, one way that they communicated was through sign language. However, there were interpreters that I remember reading about, and it was either Chief Mahaska or Mahaska the second was actually very good friends with one of the interpreters. But they're not given a lot of information. But there was a glimpse where I did see some interpreters. Should they know what they were signing? I'm sure they weren't 100% accurate. It, it would be interesting to see. Um, I have an activity with uh, probably fifth, sixth graders where we talk about traders that, um, that were in the United States. And I have them create their own sign language to communicate in order to get what they want. And it was pretty, <laughs> pretty interesting to watch them. So I imagine the same thing with the Native Americans, you know. And I think some of the sign language became standard over time, and that helped them communicate. <coughs> but they needed something universal. Yeah. Yes? Does Iowa Tribe have a Yes, Iowa Tribe Reservation, I kind of went over that just a little bit. Um, they do have reservations in the 1840s, I believe. The last reservation was in Oklahoma. They have a, a reservation in Oklahoma, and they also have a reservation in Kansas. So during Mahaska's second reign as chief, uh, that's when they were actually sent onto reservations. Okay. Burial sites uh, in this area of specific Native Americans. I don't know who is in it, but there are burial sites. I do know at uh, Cedar Bluffs, uh, if you're familiar with that area, there is a burial mound there that it has been excavated and they did find some things in it. And um, our director keeps a, a book of everything that was found in it, but it's still maintained today. It's mowed so you can see where it is. It's up high on the bluff overlooking um, the Cedar Creek and the Des Moines River. But yeah, there are some in the area. Native American mounds, they could be burial, they could be more of a ceremonial purpose. And sometimes it's hard to tell. Most of the costumes they had Right, every day would have been a lot more plain. They would have worn deer skin, breech clouds, leggings, shirts, um, less adornment for everyday use. They would have worn moccasins. They would have had special moccasins for ceremonial purposes. They liked painted pretty things to put on their clothes, and so those would be more for ceremonial. Anything else? Interesting, isn't it? I mean, that's what life was like before we were here today. Yeah. Were the Santa Claus based on the map that she had coming out of it from Were the Santa Claus transplanted later? Did they come from somewhere else? Were the Santa Fox transplanted? I did not look into those where they came from. That's a different direction, but it's interesting. But I do know that the Iowa, Sac, Fox, Odo, Missouri, they all kind of shared the same language. It was very similar. And I do know that. Right. 
the Meskwaki. Uh, I'm trying to remember. They were, I might have a note about that. I'm trying to remember. I have a huge folder full of information. The Meskwaki, I'm trying to remember the right name here. Um, they're, they're not Iowa, but they're is kind of a close relation to. If I remember right, it would be the Sacker Fox. Yeah. Do you remember? Could you talk about this? Yeah, it's either the Sacker Fox that they're part of. But they would have been um, allies with the Iowa Indians. The Meskwaki is Sac and Fox, place to Google. Red Earth people, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they, were, they were they were originally from Oklahoma, did like it, so they came up here. Everybody comes to Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. See how you just start a question and it just goes off. But yeah, as I like all tidbits of information like that. Thank you. Okay, well, I thank you for coming today. And if you can, schedule September 25th. And Linda's going to be our speaker um, about Bell Fountain. Looking forward to that. Thank you.